we need to know where what bears like the habitat they like etc and for that we need to connect you know our models with the uh, uh, data and in fact basically the way we connect our models really with data is by by you know collecting the data analyzing the data and also using models to, for data collection and data interpretation and here you know we have uh, uh, in fact uh, david gave, gave a, a great talk so i will be brief we use all kinds of sensors and the sensor networks and remote sensing for to help us develop you know these very rich models uh, uh, predicting uh, where uh, uh, species are and uh, in addition we use this amazing sensor that is the human sensor and in fact when it comes to species you know uh, birds for example humans are by far the best sensor and uh, Merlin is doing very well but far from being uh, you know uh, at the level of the human sensor uh, David gave a great talk about uh, eBirds and basically I believe these numbers I noticed that I have to update these numbers but uh, you know eBird collects all, all these data and by combining these data with uh, 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 environmental data, uh, weather, remote sensing and, uh, and uh, 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 data actually from uh, satellite data and using these uh, uh, spatial temporal models, now we have a, a much better understanding how uh, 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 the, the, the bird species migrate over time. Actually, the source for this uh, uh, animation is Daniel Fink. And in fact, we have a great collaboration with Daniel, you know, developing these models and also uh, even providing, uh, we have the, uh, a cluster uh, uh, atlas and typically a lot of these uh, 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 animations or these models are uh, uh, run using our computers. What is exciting about this is that with the, this data now, <coughs> you know, there's a, a much better understanding uh, uh, in terms of the, the habitat preference of the birds. And a good example of a, a, a program that takes advantage of this is for uh, these birds return, bird returns that is run by the, the um, Nature Conservancy. And basically because uh, uh, the idea is to protect migratory birds uh, in California against uh, drought. So now with these very accurate uh, species distribution models, you know, we know exactly when they are uh, 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 migrating through uh, Sacramento Valley. And so they have this problem where farmers can uh, 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 bid to keep the water in the rice fields coinciding with the bird migration. So I think this is a good example and in fact, using you know these models the nature conservancy has been able to uh, uh, generate additional habitat for the birds and you know this is just it's only possible because of these uh, uh, very uh, sophisticated models that uh, you know can now predict uh, when the birds uh, uh, are uh, uh, migrating through california uh, just uh, uh, as a little technical detail, you know, uh, typically these models are done, in fact, uh, using uh, random forests, but typically they are done assuming that uh, birds, uh, you know, independently one bird at a time when we know that actually birds, uh, uh, you know, there are dependence, competition and cooperation. So we are now working with, uh, with the lab on the next generation of models using deep learning, etc. And actually even uh, 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 incorporating satellite data, the actual images, and that is increasing performance of the models dramatically. We are using the same kind of models actually in, uh, in, in fact, in Africa, in Africa, there's uh, Africa is very poorly sensed 
we are lucky we have very good maps here. They don't even have vegetation maps. So we started this uh, 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 program, uh, Nekyoto, and we were quite similar to Ebert. Actually here, we, we actually uh, 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 pay the pastoralists minor, you know, very small amounts for us, but for them is meaningful. And, uh, you know, we were surprised to see how successful this program was. Well, you know, there are issues and somebody actually had a question about that. And one of the key issues, uh, uh, in fact, initially people were skeptical about uh, eBird, but given the volume of data, actually that skepticism went away, but still there are issues about uh, the fact that the data uh, 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 are, uh, 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 there's a, a bias in terms of the distribution of the observations. You know, some places are way more uh, sample than others. So in, in order to, to address that uh, problem, we actually started a program with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the lab of O, uh, the lab of ornithology called Avicaching. And the idea is really to you know, incentivize people to go to undersampled areas. And the way it works is we give points to undersampled areas and people collect these points and at the end, of the, the the season, there's a lottery where they get binoculars proportional to to the number of points this collect that they collect. You know, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is set up really as a game theoretic uh, using a game theoretic approach, where th this is actually you know what we call a bi-level optimization because the board is the organizer is trying to you know, uh, maximize the uniformity of the distribution of the, the samples. But, you know, the borders have their own interests and their own utilities. They want to maximize, you know, the pleasure of seeing birds, but also collecting points. So this is a dynamical system. So we are actually solving this, you know, from a, a, a game theoretic point of view. But, you know, the results have been fantastic here. This uh, and the nice thing, it's, it's so cool to work with the lava fall because we come up with the idea the next week they say we are ready to go, <laughs> and we say what? And so, they, I mean, it's really it has been amazing to have a collaboration with, with them because indeed, you know, there's uh, you know, this great alignment, and uh, and uh, you know, in terms of models, but for example, with this program, they started right away, and we've been collecting data. And as you see here, is from 2014, actually, just for this county. And you see how the 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 initially they there were not that many observations here. We are we were able to actually shift 20 percent of the the effort to uh, undersampled areas. And uh, uh, you know again, uh, uh, the, actually the avicaching program is a very is, uh, uh, we are collaborating directly with Daniel Fink, Chris Wood, and uh, Ian Davis. So let me now talk very briefly about uh, another project that we have in the Amazon, the Amazon, the real Amazon, in case you think it's Amazon.com. No, that is the Amazon, the real Amazon. And basically, you know, there has been an incredible proliferation of dams. In fact, the Chinese are investing like there's no tomorrow. You know, they want to build oak dams there. And uh, and uh, and obviously, you know, either power dams are uh, provide energy, but but there are many other services that the Amazon basin provides, like transportation, fisheries, forests, etc., that may be dramatically affected by by uh, you know the the proliferation of uh, the dams. So we are looking at this problem from a, a, a multi-objective optimization point of view. Basically, we want to understand you know, the trade-offs between the different ab uh, objectives. Just to give you a sense, for example, here you have two solutions. They essentially uh, lead to the same energy where you know this is the the network the river network and the little red triangle 
tri triangles are uh, dams, and you see this solution blocks the, 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 the river early on, so there's little connectivity, while this one has more connectivity. So this is the kind of trade-offs that we are trying to understand. And, you know, as an example, here we measure the energy output and here the connectivity. And this solution is if we build all the dams, we have a ton of energy, correct? Be this, but very little connectivity. In fact, because we remove access to a lot of areas, uh, uh, the fish cannot access these areas. Now, if we were to not build these red dams, now we can increase connectivity at these extra uh, areas, and you know we don't lose much in energy. So these are the trade-offs that we are looking at. Uh, you know, just you know, we have computer science again. We always have these kinds of <laughs> questions. I actually I'm working with a, a very large team of ecologists, hydrologists, and I remain. And, you know, I was telling them, well, we have 300 them, so we have two to there. 300 solutions. How how long do you think it would take for us to you know compute this Pareto frontier with this number and uh, with a big cluster? And I got an answer. Oh, that would be a long, long time. Perhaps now well, one year. Well, just for you to see, this number is. 10 to the 90th, which is above, you know, the number of seconds is the Big Bang is 10 to the 17th. So it's a big number. You know, if we were to compute all the solutions, really, uh, uh, it would take forever, uh, literally. Well, so we are developing algorithms for this. And in fact, by being smart, we can actually speed up you know, the results that I showed you are worst case scenario, but we can do better. And in fact, we can just to give a, an example, we actually just for two objectives, when we uh, are trying to see the trade-offs between energy and connectivity, we can actually compute the Pareto frontier in 212 seconds, which is quite remarkable. I, 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 I was surprised we were able to do this. If we approximate it with guarantees, we can do it much faster. And in fact, you know, this is a little technical, but it, just to show that, uh, you know, the exact approach versus the approximate, actually, the, uh, the, there's not much difference. The, the approximation is actually better than the guarantee. And, but, you know, overall, we can now uh, produce solutions for, uh, for objectives in just, you know, uh, ranging from six minutes if we have a guarantee of 75% to five days if we have a guarantee of 95%. So meaning that we are at most 5% from the optimal. So, but this is the kinds of things that we do. We also, you know, are developing visualizations in this case. You see here, we have a visualization. This is the energy amount. This is the connectivity, and then the color is the seismic risk, whether or not the solutions are, you know, have high seismic risk. For example, a solution here, oh, you cannot see that. So a solution here has high energy, low connectivity, and it's red, so it's very high seismic risk. We also, because these are multi-objective uh, uh, problems, we also develop this uh, parallel coordinate plots to visualize the different objectives and then we rank solutions, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, to understand the Pareto frontier in terms of the frequency, how the, the, the dams uh, are selected. So this is, I think, more detailed probably and then we, you, if you have questions, please, I'm happy to go over this. Again, this is a... Um, uh, a large team of uh, uh, researchers, you know, from Cornell and also uh, uh, ecologists and hydrologists actually from Peru, from Brazil, from uh, Colombia, uh, etc. So I have like 10, 15 minutes. 
And uh, I'm now going to talk about a completely different topic, but I actually think it has some uh, 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 intersection with things that BTI is doing. And basically this is, we are also working on uh, accelerating discovery for uh, sustainable materials. Again, you know, one, you may wonder how I end up doing all these projects that are so different. And, you know, my, the key rule is, you know, we need, the projects have to be aligned with our expertise, but we also have to have access to the highest uh, level of expertise in the domain we are uh, 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 working, like that's why we work with the lava fall. We are, uh, or, you know, we are working with uh, specialists in terms of the Amazon. We have a whole team of people highly uh, knowledgeable and involved uh, 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 an expert in terms of the domain. We also, Cornell has a, a, a great uh, uh, department of uh, uh, material science. So, and indeed, you know, serendipity actually, yes, uh, Bruce Vandover uh, is the, uh, the, the chair and I met Bruce Vandover when we would watch baseball games because our sons were playing baseball and, uh, you know, you start talking and you see, ah, oh, that's interesting. And so we have actually done in, uh, tremendous work with, the, the, uh, with them, in, also uh, jo uh, John Goodwire. John Goodwire was actually uh, uh, a, post, uh, a student and a postdoc here, and now he's at Caltech. And basically what we are doing is we are working with them on uh, advancing, you know, uh, accelerating the development of solar fuel generators. You know, solar fuels are uh, quite promising and you, you can actually store uh, solar fuels. And just to give you a very brief idea what goes on in, into, you know, this high throughput materials discovery, what they do is, you know, uh, um, material science, basically, they, they have this uh, 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 way of synthesizing materials where here you see an apparatus for, with three guns and there's a wafer and these three uh, guns uh, each gun has an element uh, or a metal in this case, and so they they sp they 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 uh, sputter the the elements onto the wafer, and it's just like atomic spray painting. It's like if you have three colors, you know, red, green, and blue. The, the, there will be areas more red, more green, and blue, but then they mix up and new colors are formed. That's exactly what they do with materials. So then they need to understand, uh, characterize the materials. And, you know, they cannot really see the structure of the materials, so they do uh, X-ray diffraction to try to infer the uh, crystal structure from the X-ray diffraction patterns, which, you know, you are familiar, that is not much different than what uh, Watson and Crick did to uncover uh, the structure of DNA. Except here, you know, it's more, way more complicated than proteins because now here we have a, a, a ternary representation, you know, like this point is 100% metal 2, this point is half metal 2, metal 1, and each point was, you know, subject to a, 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 a X-ray diffraction, so now we have all the patterns, you know, uh, here, all the X-ray diffraction patterns, and what we want to do is we want to infer the crystal structure from the X-ray diffraction patterns. So this is what we call a source separation problem, and it's very challenging, and in fact, much more challenging than with proteins, because the crystal structures get all mixed up, so we need to demix them. And, you know, even for humans, experts, they take, they can analyze maybe 10, 100 systems a year. It takes forever. So, you know, but in case you think this problem is really quite unique, no, this problem is actually a problem that is 
you know, uh, when we are trying to uh, uh, identify uh, flight codes, we are also doing source separation where we have a signal and we want to identify the elephant calls or the flight calls, etc. So we are actually working also uh, on these problems. But you may have heard of topic modeling if you have not heard that's okay but basically that's what like google does when you are given a set of documents and you want to extract the key topics of the document so all these problems are related and in fact you know this is what we call a matrix factorization i'm not going to go into details but essentially is we want to extract these topics so you know what the reason we love this problem is the current state of the art of machine learning just fails miserably so that's where we come in you know that's why i like this problem <coughs> because the solutions produced by machine learning really fail to to enforce the physics of uh, uh, the materials <coughs> And therefore, we need to develop new techniques to actually combine the data and enforce the physical constraints. So we are basically integrating machine learning with what we call reasoning uh, techniques and optimization techniques. And we are also using crowdsourcing and actually citizen science to help on this project. Just to give you a sense, how do we do this? For example, here, what you see here is a bunch of X-ray diffraction patterns that are stacked, but then I convert this into a heat map. And, you know, I, we give this to the Amazon Turk or actually call a, you know, high school students, and they don't need to know a thing about the uh, uh, X-rays. We just ask them to identify patterns. And even if you look at this picture, you can identify clearly there's a pattern, you know, all these uh, 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 blobs, in fact, we literally tell them they need to look for blobs that have the same length, they have to start and end at the same uh, level, and you can immediately see th this. You can also see that the machine thinks there are also peaks there, but this is just background noise. So humans can discard this very easily, but the machine is trying to interpret these signals when it's just noise. So by using humans, we can very easily, because they were able to immediately detect this pattern, and this is a way of inject, we inject this information into our uh, 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 algorithms or, you know, uh, uh, running, uh, pr uh, the, um, provide the program with this information and we can, you know, reduce the, the solution time dramatically. We, you know, we have used, developed actually a system incorporating all these ideas that led to the discover a new family of solar light uh, absorbers by our colleagues at Caltech. And we actually also got a, a, an award at AAAI. And we are now actually producing a, a, an integrated version of the, this. We just got a, a big uh, MURI grant uh, to uh, produce Sarah that is going to encapsulate the scientific method and, you know, uh, uh, plan and design experiments all, uh, in a more automated way and, uh, you know, doing this cycle. Just uh, uh, now relating this problem, because again, it may seem very far from what you are doing, but uh, here we actually have a, a, a very nice collaboration with Drew Harvell, and basically here we are trying to automate the, the uh, identification of this uh, eelgrass wasting disease, and again, we use crowdsourcing, and in fact, we use you know a combination of deep learning and what we call multi-arm bandits. Again, it's not relevant, but it's just a, 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 a way of when we have tasks that requ require expert knowledge, we want to 
uh, you know, uh, uh, the system to learn very quickly how to classify the image in an automated way, minimizing export time. So this is what this system is about, is really to learn very quickly by giving, you know, the right, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, multi-arms come from uh, the metaphor is when you go to Las Vegas and play uh, slot machine, you 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 have to decide what uh, what arm to pull. So and you do what we call an exploitation and exploration, where uh, exploration you explore arms that you have not explored before. Exploitation you explore arms that you are certain that uh, or you are confident that they give you good results. So maybe Las Vegas is not the best metaphor because <laughs> you shouldn't be confident. But, you know, uh, the big picture again, and uh, to go back to, to the, 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 you know, the subway line, basically, you know, I talked about high throughput material structure identification, how we want to infer crystal structures from X-ray diffraction patterns. I alluded to identifying elephant calls, which we are also working with the lava fall on that project. And, you know, all these problems are source separation problems. There are many others where you have a signal and you want to identify, you know, the components of the signal. If it's crystal structures or uh, elephant calls or flight calls or also uh, 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 if it is a, 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 a sick uh, a pixel or, or a healthy or sick pixel, etc. And, you know, the way we operate, actually, I these students are working, uh, uh, involved in all these projects because, you know, they these projects are actually uh, 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 linked by a common subway line because basically this is what we call pattern decomposition for big data. And uh, uh, this is exactly what you see here. And in particular, this, this is, uh, uh, you know, these are several projects that are involved. For example, we are also going to start a project on high throughput plant phenotyping. So all these problems are linked together, computationally speaking. So uh, I'm about to wrap up and basically, you know, this expedition has been incredible, uh, you know, as a computer science, you know, the problems that we are exposed to and uh, are just amazing in terms of societal impact. But for me also, uh, it, it actually, you know, the questions are different from many other questions that we are uh, exposed or I had been exposed. So it's actually leading to new science, new computer science, and also, uh, you know, uh, uh, having impact in terms of, uh, you know, these different fields. So this is now uh, computational sustainability is way beyond Cornell. We have conference, there are conference and uh, all over the world. So this is now a big community. And, but, you know, uh, actually we have this uh, virtual seminar recently that we had Vipin Kumar talk, talking about climate change and uh, uh, how computer science can uh, help, you know, monitor and understand climate change. And, but, you know, the big picture uh, for me is that on one hand, uh, you know, I see this field as a two-way street, you know, we, we hope to inject some computational thinking and methodology in terms of uh, to address sustainability questions. But, you know, it's also incredibly rewarding because <coughs> we are exposed to, you know, new challenge problems. And the, the big secret that I actually tell my students, we have a chance to work with incredibly smart people across different fields, you know, with, uh, you know, tremendous experience, you know, like the lab of all, we interact with biologists, with the material science, etc. And these people are super smart and have great ideas and, you know, great uh, uh, formalisms and concepts. Often, they may be not be very strong in the computational side, and that's where we come in. But but it's such a an amazing you know two way street. I I've learned a lot from these collaborations, and you know I'm a big fan of collaborations, and that has actually led for uh, you know to uh, you know these interactions to foundational contributions to computer science, and we've advanced that field. 
the field of computer science, but also having, you know, societal impact, which is really uh, 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 tremendous. You know, I always say, you know, computer science are spending, you know, tremendous amount of time deciding you know, another ad for Google or Facebook or whatever. Why not use our brain cells in a more uh, creative and uh, useful way? So, thank you. <laughs> so I think we have time for one or two questions. And Carlo, if you wouldn't mind repeating the questions so our streaming audience can Oh, hear. sure. Thank you. You, you mentioned uh, about plant high throughput phenotyping. Mm -hmm. You might tell us a little bit more about what you do. Well, we actually, this is, I've been talking to people, we are, uh, I, you know, this is clearly uh, uh, one of these source separation problems. And so I cannot tell you much because we actually are in the process of starting. But, but I believe that, you know, the same kinds of uh, ideas that we are using, you know, for uh, uh, inferring crystal structures from x-rays or we, you know, we are using all kinds of data, you know, uh, x-rays or Raman data or, you know, so different ways of characterizing. And we, I believe this is going to be uh, uh, very useful because, you know, plant phenotyping is essentially like, uh, uh, you can't even think, and in fact, there was a, a, an article recently uh, about uh, how they are using topic modeling techniques to to, to do phenotyping. So, so in fact, we, we actually had this uh, as a virtual seminar. So, I think that is a, a great opportunity. If to, we haven't really done much there, but uh, but clearly, you know, it is uh, along the same lines, and uh, and I'm sure there will be a lot of synergy there. Take one more question. Okay. Well, thank you, Carlos. <laughs> Oh, so, okay. No, I was going to take the computer, but it's not my computer. I think we need it. <laughs> okay, our last speaker for this morning is Dr. Carol Huang. Carol is an assistant professor in the Center of Genomics and Systems Biology at NYU, building a research program on plant regulatory genomics. She is interested in the big question of how intraspecific genome and epigenome variations give rise to phenotypic variations in realistic environment. Her lab utilizes and develops next generation sequencing methods for discovery of genome-wide regulatory elements with a particular focus on how genome sequence and DNA methylation variations found in populations affect transcription factor binding and transcriptional regulatory networks in a cell type specific manner. Carol obtained her bachelor's degree in computer science and biology at the University of British Columbia and her PhD in computational and systems biology at MIT, where she worked on developing computational algorithms for constructing cellular signaling networks. For her postdoctoral training, she joined Joseph Ecker's lab in the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, and since then she has been learning the fascinating biology of plants every day. Let's welcome Carol. Do you hear me at the back? Good. I want to thank the organizers for, for the opportunities to tell you about my work. Um, today, I'll tell you some uh, two stories about how we create genome-wide maps or regulatory elements and the efforts that we used uh, spent to learn new biology from these maps. So I'll tell you about two stories, which I think about them as going deep versus going wide. So the first story, which is a shorter story, we focus on going deep into looking into transcription regulatory networks in response to a plant hormone ABA. And the second story will, fo will go wide, focus on getting 
genome-wide transcription factor binding site maps for hundreds of transcription factors using a method that we developed called DAPSEQ. And these two projects were in, developed in close collaboration with two very brilliant plant biologists in Joe's lab when I was doing my postdoc. So I'll start with the first story, which we characterize the transcriptional regulatory network of abscisic acid response in Arabidopsis. So Arabidopsis, um, ABA or abscisic acid is a vital hormone that known to play key roles in plant response to cellular dehydration, and it's also known as the drought hormone. And um, ABA response uh, is um, Place, uh, the, the functional roles of ABA involve, uh, include uh, stomat, stomatal closure uh, in gut cells, um, seed dormancy in seed, and also stress response and growth regulation during vegetative growth. Uh, here I'll show you some phenotypes of ABA mutants in uh, both Arabidopsis in maize, uh, lots of function mutations in the transcription factors in ABA pathway. Uh, these plants are insensitive to ABA-induced germination inhibition, as you can see in both Arabidopsis in maize. And ABA itself is a growth inhibitor. However, ABA synthesis mutants have a stunted growth phenotype, um, which we believe is due to its inability to reduce transpiration and also um, uh, establish turgor. So the signaling components, the protein signaling components of the ABA signaling pathway has been identified Although the downstream transcriptional regulation of the targets of transcription factors in this pathway are less well established. So for our experiments, we decided to focus on identifying the downstream targets of the transcription factors in the ABA pathway involved in growth regulation. So our experiment setup is that we took 3 day oe related seedlings and uh, treated them with ABA or mock treatment using a simple buffer exchange. And then we perform time course RNAC experiment in the first one to 60 hours following ABA treatment and CHIP-seq at four hours following ABA treatment. In CHIP-seq, we generated um, transgenic plant lines that tag specific uh, transcription factors of interest with GIP tag. And then we can use a GIP, anti-GIP antibody to pull down the transcription factor of interest along with its bound DNA fragments and sequences fragments map back to the genome will let us identify the genome or binding locations of these factors. So uh, as an overview, uh, using the RNA-seq data, we, we see that there's a wide range of transcription response, response to ABA, ranging from highly activation to repression. Using the CHIP-seq data for the 21 transcription factors that we chip plus or minus ABA, we see that these factors targets between 1,000 to over 10,000 sites in the genome. So as an uh, example showing you the, the data in the genome browser, uh, these two genes are known targets of ABA. And the first six tracks in the genome browser, this genome browser view represent the RNA-seq data at one hour, four hour, eight hour, uh, plus and minus ABA. And the rest of the tracks are the chip-seq, uh, uh, the, the chip-seq reads mapped to the genome at that location are also plus and minus ABA. We see that from the RNA-C, it's really clear that uh, the transcript level of these target genes increases with time and uh, compared to mock treatment. And what's more curious is we see a lot of these um, dynamic binding sites where the transcription factor binding dramatically increase following ABA treatment. So the, I'm showing you two, uh, two of the most dramatic factors here, Z6 and HSF6. A6A. So we decided to look into more about this dynamic binding. And what we did was we um, look at the pattern of this transcription factor dynamic binding in relation to the different level of the gene regulation that we identify in RNA-seq data. We see that the highly upregulated genes tend to be targeted by larger number of transcription factors that display larger upregulation in the promoter region of these genes. What's more curious is that when we put all this data in a network context, where we map the connections between the TF that we chip our data set and the known components in the ABA pathway, such as um, metabolism, transport, 
labia receptors, the kinases and phosphatases, and the protein involved in uh, uh, um, degradation. We see that a lot of these uh, non ABA pathway components are targeted by a large number of transcription factors that upregulate their binding in response to ABA. So we can quantify this by plotting the percentage of genes uh, targeted by a, a given number of transcription factors in a highly upregulated manner, and then look into the um, percentage of these genes with uh, annotated functions in the ABA pathway. We see that the larger number of genes, the larger number of TA targeted a particular gene, the more likely that the gene is involved in ABA response. And this is not the case for uh, uh, target genes, uh, for, for genes annotated to functioning other hormones. So this led to wonder if we can use this uh, observation as a predictor for predicting uh, new components in the ABA regulatory network. So Liang found out that for a particular family of genes called, uh, we, we later named them DIC1 and DIC2 and DIC1-like genes, um, the chip TFs in our data set highly targeted uh, this family of uh, 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 six genes. And when Liang created um, overexpresses, uh, uh, transgenic plants overexpressing DIC1 and DIC2 under a DEX-inducible promoter, um, in, when there's no ABA uh, with and without that, uh, with and without DEX, we see that uh, this plants is overexpressing DIC1 and DIC2 uh, are virtually identical to the control plants overexpressing GFP. When we increase the ABA concentration, you can gradually see that these uh, DIC1 and DIC2 overexpressors are more sensitive to ABA, uh, uh, are more sensitive to ABA in terms of uh, delay hypocardial greening. And this, a similar sort of response is observed when we treat the plants with uh, uh, high salinity conditions. So you can see that uh, the DIC1, DIC2 plant overexpresses when uh, they are induced, uh, when, the, when the expression is induced by DAX, we see this, these plants have displayed a much higher degree of, uh, of bleaching. This and also other data has led us to believe that we, using this method, we can identify novel pathway components involved in ABA salinity response. So to summarize this part of the talk, um, I have told you that we have used DAPSEQ for a large number of our uh, ABA response transcription factors to eliminate the relationship between dynamic TF binding and gene expression patterns. And also by analyzing the network connectivity of the, ADA, the, the ABA uh, uh, pathway components, we're able to identify new regulators, of ABA and salinity response. So as we're going through this project, we started to have access to international collaboration uh, of called the 1001 genomes that uh, aims to catalog genetic variations in Arabidopsis natural populations collected throughout the world. Uh, at the end, this uh, uh, international consortium released over 1100 accessions with sequenced genomes, transcriptomes, and methanomes. So this led us to uh, ask the question whether or not we can start to uh, utilize this resource and expand beyond the few accessions that we traditionally do our experiments on to really look at population-specific regulatory elements uh, and associate those regulatory elements to the diverse phenotypes of these accessions. So to give you some statistics of the data from the 2001 Genomes Project, on average, we can find about one SNPs and in every A base pair, combining all the SNPs that are found in the over 1,100 sessions. And uh, not very surprisingly, a very small fraction of these SNPs map to exons, and even small fraction actually cause coding change. And this is also the situation found in uh, much larger genomes, such as maize and human. So Ed Buckler's lab in 2004 published this paper where they showed that a lot of the GWAS hits associated with maize phenotypes actually map to, not, do not map to uh, coding region of proteins. And for humans, uh, when I took the 33,000 association uh, between uh, genetic variants and, and, and traits, mostly uh, diseases, 
uh, we found out that like less than 5% of the, the genetic disease associated genetic variants are associated, uh, are found in coding regions. So we believe that our uh, transcription factor binding sites is an important class of regulatory elements for interpreting these genetic variations. Uh, this, uh, uh, this framework is uh, inspired by a lot of studies um, of human diseases. So early work by my studies group in Stanford has found that, for example, in this, um, this one base change in the binding motif of an color B transcription factor had led to changes in the occupancy of this transcription factor in individuals with different genotypes at this site. And later on, the, open, uh, the human epigenome roadmap project have identified a lot more uh, disease-associated SNPs that causes disruption in the transcription factor binding motif and leading to changes in transcription factor occupancy. So to actually get um, to know um, genome-wide binding site maps to do this kind of annotation, we need to know, uh, be able to generate genome-wide transcription factor binding sites for a large number of factors. So we look at the a few more popular methods for identifying transcription factor binding sites. The first method is called chip seq which I just told you about, uh, where uh, you use an antibody to boil down a factor of interest with uh, its bound DNA fragments and then sequence this fragment to identify the binding site. chip seq is uh, kind of the gold standard in the field because it identifies in vivo binding sites. Although it's a very technically challenging method, it requires antibody to the protein of interest or, or you need to tag the, your protein of interest transgenically. And for lower expressed proteins, especially transcription factors, it requires a large number of cells. Another in vitro method uh, is called protein mi binding microarray, where you will synthesize uh, sequences of eight to 10 base pairs on a glass slide, and then you incubate this glass slide with your, with your protein of interest to identify where, uh, uh, what, what, what sequences this transcription factor likes to bind. This method can be scaled up Although because these sequences are artificial, it has limited genomic or DNA methylation context that transcription factors are likely to uh, uh, um, encounter in vivo. So for our project, we set this goals that we need to um, be able to, be able to um, develop a method that allows large scale genome-wide identification of transcription factor binding sites in native genomic and methylation context. The method that we come up with is called DAPSEQ, stands for DNA Affinity Purification Sequencing, and it was developed in very close collaboration with Rona O'Malley, uh, a postdoc in Joachim's lab. So DAPSEQ method is, is quite straightforward to carry out. So in the first step, you sonicate, you, you, you purify genomic DNA using your Fourier method, such as you know, color from extraction. You sonicate a genomic DNA into 200 base pair fragment, and then like gate to the end of this uh, DNA pieces, Illumina compatible sequencing adapters. In step two, uh, separately from the uh, uh, generation of the DAP library, you would construct uh, expression vectors of transcription factor with a peptide tag for purification, such as HALO or GST. You can then express this transcription factor in vitro and immobilize them on affinity beads. The, three steps, the first step, you would mix the DAP library and the in vitro express transcription factor. You wash away the unbound DNA fragments and PCR amplify the bound DNA uh, pieces to generate the sequencing library that you can sequence on the Illumina platform. Afterwards, you do uh, a kind of a, a pipeline that's very similar to ChIP-seq. You map the reads to the genome, and uh, which will allow you to identify regions of significant read pile up, known as peaks. That's indicative of a binding signal. So here um, is a is a peak for the ABI5 transcription factor in the ABI5 promoter itself, and the uh, uh, green color represents reads mapped to the plus strand, and the dark red color represents peaks mapped to the uh, reads mapped to the minus strand. So the first question that we answer need to answer when we um, develop this method is: Is DAPSI doing anything sensible? In other words, uh, are DAPSI identified binding sites correspond to anything in vivo? 
So for this, we did a comparison of the FC and ChIPC data for the transcription factor of CCS in SENS5. As I showed you earlier, um, ABI5 uh, mutant is insensitive to ABA-induced germination inhibition. So Liang's generated two uh, ABI5 DAPS, uh, chip seq data set. The first uses a native antibody against ABI5. The second uses an anti-GRP antibody against a YPAT tag ABI5. And we want to show that even though uh, all three libraries identify thousands of binding sites, the DAP libraries was only sequenced to about one-fifth of the sequencing depth of the chip library uh, with a higher signal-to-noise ratio. We expect, when we expect the DAPC and ChIPC peak in the genome browser, uh, here I'm showing you three non abi 5 targets, uh, abi 5 RGA, and AFB2. Uh, we see that the DAPC peaks in general have a much sharper appearance, uh, indicating that it has uh, a higher resolution compared to ChIPSeq. And when we look at the, uh, promote, uh, the, the target sites uh, in the RGA promoter, although the YPAT chip peak and the DAPC peak have perfect correspondence, the antibody chip peak uh, is, is rather ambiguous because of this high uh, level of uh, background noise. And in terms of the uh, identified uh, sequence motifs, DAPC was able to pull out motifs that are quite similar to ChIPSeq and with uh, flanking sequences that's missing in the in vitro method uh, 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 in, in a motif identified by in vitro methods uh, such as PBM. So overall, when we look into the uh, DAPC DAP and ChIPC overlap, we see that that is able to uh, capture majority of ChIPC peaks. And the overlap with the antibody chip is about 80%, and the overlap with the YPAT chip is about 60%. Uh, because this antibody chip uh, may have some signal to noise problem, uh, as uh, I showed you earlier, and the uh, YPAT uh, line for this uh, 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 ABI5 uh, uh, chip seq data set is a slight O expressor. So some of these peaks we believe might be false positives. So we concluded that that is able to capture between 60 to 80 percent of the chip seq peak. So now we look into uh, the properties of the peaks that are unique to either DAP or CHIP. For DAP only sites, we see that if we include uh, open chromatin regions identified by DNA's have sensitivity, we can gradually push up the overlap with DAP. This suggests to us that the DAP only sites might be condition specific binding sites uh, that are absent in the particular uh, CHIP C condition that we perform our experiment. For chip-only sites, when we plotted the motif score underneath the peaks for different categories of overlap, we see that the, um, the chip-only sites, which is the blue color here, has much weaker motif score compared to uh, uh, that only sites, or that uh, uh, sites are shared between that and chip. This led us to believe that the chip-only sites might be very weak binding sites that are stabilized by protein-protein interaction or uh, in direct binding sites pulled down in chip. We then explore whether we can use a uh, depth signal calculated by just counting the reads in the depth seek peak as a predictor for chip binding. So uh, we calculate two performance metrics generally used in this kind of uh, classification scenario. The first metric is called precision, which is uh, equivalent to one minus false discovery rate that calculates the percentage of um, binding site predict predicted by depth and what percentage of that is actually found in chip. And the second performance metric is called recall, which is equivalent to sensitivity. It calculates out of all the binding sites set to be bound by chip, what percentage of sites can be recovered by depth. As you, keep, as you can imagine, you can change the overlap of these two circles by changing the threshold on the depth signal. Uh, we generate um, this uh, pre pre precision and recall values for a variety of uh, uh, thresholds on the depth signal to create what's known as the precision and recall graph on the right. For comparison, we use um, motif score, which just calculate how well a particular binding site matches the canonical motif of ABI5 
as a predictor for in vivo chip binding. You can see that um, the DAP signal predictor is able to perform, uh, is able to achieve uh, about 20% more preci higher precision or lower false positive compared to just using a motif score for all, all levels of recall. So the question is, why is that signal that's better? Our hypothesis is that DAPC, because we are looking into uh, the protein binding to genomic DNA, is able to capture binding site environment present on the genomic DNA, uh, not captured by the uh, sequence motif. To test this hypothesis, we built a decision tree model that incorporated motif score and other binding site environment features such as methylation on the DNA, the multi-multiplicity, which uh, uh, is a feature that counts how many motifs in, are present in the binding peak, and also the shape of the DNA surrounding the, 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 the binding motif. And for comparison, we build the same decision tree uh, um, classifier model where the only we replace the motif score feature by a depth signal feature while keeping all the uh, um, environment, binding environment features. This two model will allow us to calculate the importance of these features in predicting in, what in vivo binding. So on here on the right, I'm showing you a feature importance plot where on the x-axis are the features that go into predicting in vivo binding. On the y-axis are the relative importance of these features in predicting in vivo binding. We can see that comparing the motif score model and the DAP signal model, the methylation feature and the motif multiplicity feature are very important in the motif score model, but it's less important in the DAP signal model. This suggests to us that um, the DAP signal itself was able to capture implicitly some of the impact uh, of methylation and motif multiplicity on transcription factor binding. Interestingly, when we perform the same analysis for ana 55 which we also have DAPC and CHIP-seq data, we see that the uh, DNA shape features are very important for predicting binding for this factor in the motif score model. And these features are not used much in the DAP signal model, suggesting to us that the DAP signal, uh, just based on counting sequence and reads, um, is able to capture uh, a transcription factor specific requirement for the binding site environment. So having established that DAPC is doing something sensible, we extended our data collection to the whole uh, 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 set of TF clones or Arabidopsis. In a period a little bit over five months, we screened over 1,700 uh, TF clones in uh, over 2,000 experiments. We successfully identified motifs for 529 transcription factors from 54 family. And collectively, we see over 2.7 million binding events that occupy about 10% of the Arcadopsis genome. And we call the collection of all these transcription factor binding sites, the Arcadopsis system. And we have released all the motifs and peaks uh, on, on our browser, uh, on our website. And uh, a lot of people like to look at this genome browser and look at the genes, their favorite genes, and then look at the, uh, all the factors that are binding to the promoter region or um, other regions of, the, of its favorite, their favorite gene. And we also have this motif browser where you can browse um, uh, all the motifs that we have and download the data. So uh, using this 529 transcription factor motifs, we perform a hierarchical clustering of these motifs and here I'm showing you the clustering dendrogram in the form of both a rooted tree and unrooted tree. And when I did the uh, uh, dynamic tree cut algorithm uh, to, uh, uh, to classify these motifs into 85 motif types that roughly correspond to transcription factor families uh, that I plotted in different colors here. Another thing that I wanted to point out is in the outer ring of this unrooted tree, the dark green color represent TF that we've previously identified, experimentally identified motifs. And the light green color represents new motif that we identify using DAPSeq, which is uh, over half of all the motifs, uh, all the 529 motifs. From this uh, 529, we uh, identify 
a set of 57 representative transcription factors that represent the motif diversity and also with relatively well characterized function. We then we did um, gene ontology enrichment analysis for the target genes near the peaks, that DAPSI peaks of these transcription factors. And what we see is a lot of the, so this heat map is showing uh, the transcription factors in the columns and the enriched flow terms in the rows. And the color maps to the enrichment of the TF target and a particular goal term. So you can see a lot of the uh, um, transcription factors have target genes enriched in go categories that, that are consistent with their known function. For example, uh, in box one, hormone regulated uh, growth is so highly associated with the transcription factor monoprus or F5 in the oxygen response family, the oxygen response factor family. And in box three, which is with, uh, 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 the, the goal term immune system process are specifically associated with two transcription factors, PGA5 and a worky transcription factor. As I told you earlier, um, when we did clustering on the, the entire set of motifs, the, 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 the individual clusters correspond to transcription factor families. Um, uh, when we actually look into each family in more detail, uh, we can actually see, um, the, uh, we can subdivide each, uh, some of the families, the large tier family into classes based on their motif preferences. So for example, for the BZF family of transcription factors, we're able to uh, 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 classify the, their binding preferences into three classes. And where intriguingly, each of these class of uh, uh, BZIFs are, have very distinct uh, enriched goal terms for their target genes. So for example, the class one uh, BZIFs are enriched for uh, responses related to abiotic stress, and the class two BZIFs are enriched for responses to biotic response and the class with BZIFs are involved in uh, meristem growth and, and, and cell uh, tissue development. This tells us that even though um, the binding motifs for members of the, in, the, in, the transcription, in one transcription factor family uh, tend to be, even though they tend to be very similar, there are enough differences uh, in the genome-wide binding profile that we're able to be uh, extracted by DAPSEQ. So to summarize this part of the talk, I'll show you that DAPC is a simple and effective method for identifying genome-wide transcription factor binding sites. And we're able to uh, screen the whole Arbidopsis TF collection to identify 529 transcription factor motifs in 2.7 million binding events. DAPC compares favorably to motif-based methods to predict in vivo binding because it's able to capture TF-specific binding environment such as motif cluster, methylation, and the shape of the DNA. And lastly, gene ontology enrichment analysis of DAPSI targets identify known and uh, also novel uh, transcription factor function. The last few minutes, I would like to show you a little bit of a vignette of how we have used DAPSI data to look at cooperative binding of oxygen response factor hormone dimers. So uh, this is the general structure of the uh, oxygen response factor family. And the binding of our family of transcription factors, or DNA, is known to have strong preferences for uh, repeats of the oxygen response element at uh, defined orientation and spacing. So there are three possible uh, uh, orientations of the uh, ox oxygen response element repeats, direct repeat, inverted repeat, and inverted repeat. And um, direct repeats in about 10 base pair, uh, 10 to 12 base pair is the well-known DR5, uh, 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 DR5 uh, 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 reporter for oxen. And the inverted repeat uh, uh, mediated by dimerization between the dimerization domain of the R protein uh, is uh, 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 recently published uh, by, uh, uh, it's been identified by a uh, uh, crystal structure, uh, X-ray crystallization study. So what we did is using our DAPSEQ data. Oh, I don't know. Oh, that's it. Okay, it's supposed to say motif spacing. 
Um, and this is Arabidopsis R5 on Arabidopsis DNA. So, <laughs> just imagine it's there. Um, so, the, so what, what we did here is we just simply calculate the relative um, uh, frequency of where we find adaptive peaks and specific uh, uh, repeat repeats and a specific spacing. So you can see for Arabidopsis R5 or Arabidopsis DNA, uh, the, the direct repeat uh, it has a preference for binding at uh, 10, 15, and 25, uh, 10, 20, and 30 base pair. For EYT repeat, you have a preference for 15 and 25 base pair. And as I mentioned previously, the direct repeat at 10 to 12 base pair is the DR5 reporter. And the EYT repeat and uh, 16 to 18 base pair is the uh, uh, um, model published by the crystal structure. So we did the same experiment, but using Arbidopsis R2 on Arbidopsis uh, DNA. R2 is a very close uh, family member uh, to, uh, to the R5, although it has fairly distinct function. And they have, so you, and they have very similar uh, binding motifs. And using the same analysis, we can see that R2 actually binds to a subset of the uh, uh, um, preferred spacing groups compared to R5. Of, uh, the R family of transcription factors uh, originated from the first land plant, and we uh, compared the, uh, um, the binding pattern of R in maize compared to R uh, uh the two species that were about 140 to 150 million years ago. GMR29 is a, a maize co-orthologue co of R Pedopsis R5. You can see that uh, using uh, the, the maize protein on maize DNA, uh, the, 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 the binding pattern of the maize protein, uh, the maize experiment is really a subset of the binding pattern uh, for the uh, our Pedopsis experiment. So we wanted to know whether this difference is due to the protein or the DNA. So what we did next is we did the experiment using the maize R protein, but on the R Pedopsis DNA. And we can see that the pattern is actually more similar to the maize experiment compared to the Arabidopsis experiment. This led us to believe that uh, this kind of uh, bias uh, requirement for spacing between motif repeats is due to the protein, not the DNA. So it's a control experiment when we analyze uh, the Arabidopsis genome and the maize genome at genome-wide level, we do not see a uh, uh, preference, uh, a bias uh, motif spacing. So this lets us to believe that we see this kind of uh, uh, regular spacing for motif repeats is really due to the uh, homodimerization in the DAB experiment. So then the last um, uh, analysis that we did, we uh, look at the in vivo relevance of the uh, dab binding pattern. So using a set of R5 uh, targets identified in uh, Dolph Wiggles group, uh, we plotted the DAP seq binding uh, 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 signal in the promoter region of the R5 targets versus a set of tar uh, uh, background genes. We see that the, um, in DAP seq we can see much stronger binding in the target R5 target genes compared to a set of background genes. And just show you an example. So IA5 is a known uh, target of the R5 transcription factor. You see this huge, uh, very strong binding site in the DAPSeq, and also 13 uh, motif repeats uh, in, in the expected spacing. To summarize this final talk, I have shown you that we were able to use DAPSeq to identify uh, the R motif architecture and expanding the spacing group preference for both the direct repeat and an inverted repeat and found new space and preference for inverted repeat. And um, the, the DAPSIC data is relevant in vivo because we can find enrichment in vivo uh, R5 targets. So uh, we are now working on some wide, uh, more applications of DAPSIC, such as uh, developing sequential methods so that we can look at uh, uh, binding patterns of transcription factor complexes. 
We are also interested in applying depth seek to the RF reductions accession collection that I told you earlier, where uh, we can use uh, uh, this method to, to identify population specific regulatory elements. So just show you some preliminary data. We have the uh, uh, Prodoxus VND7 transcription factor uh, binding, uh, doing binding reaction on four of the Dubsys accessions. And we are also interested in uh, using this, this method in comparison, in, 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 in uh, uh, conjunction with uh, um, in silico motile analysis to identify concern regulatory elements. So I'd like to acknowledge um, people who have supported my work. I'd like to thank uh, Joe, who has given out of resources and patience for these studies. I'll uh, mention Ronan and Liang, who has uh, been instrumental in getting these data sets. And our uh, maze uh, data set is from our collaborator in Rutgers, uh, Andrea and Mary. And these are our funding sources. And lastly, uh, I just started my lab a few months ago, not too far from here. And I'm looking for you to help me clean up this lab. It's, it's less clean now, so yeah. I'll have your quick questions. Everybody's hungry. There we go. <laughs> yes. In any of the um, any of the population variation at these sites, do you see overall like a level of constraints around a lot of these binding domains? Yes. So the question is whether or not I see uh, evolutionary constraints uh, near the uh, uh, um, uh, next to the or, or in the binding sites that are identified by that. Yes. Uh, it's we do see. Um, I say it's, it's, I, I think what you see is a rather factor specific. So some TF would like to, uh, um, uh, so what we did was we looked at the uh, level of conservation, 100 base pairs next to the binding site. And uh, we do see some factors will have higher level of conservation compared to, at, at this binding site compared to the flanking regions. But so for some other factors, actually more diverse. So yeah, so, so it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, uh, um, observation and also follow up on like why some factors are uh, binding sites are concerned, why are not, some, some are not, yeah. Does that seem to also correspond to where they are, like the, uh, the gene regulatory domain or the, the gene networks? So do you see more constraints around higher, kind of more highly expressed genes such as housekeeping genes as well? Right, that's a, that's a good question. We haven't done that kind of analysis of uh, um, uh, looking into conservation looking at different uh, categories of uh, genes based on their function. Yeah, but that's something definitely uh, interesting to look into. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, questions? All right, so I think we'll have a bit of a break and we'll be back here at 1.30. Uh, and uh, let's give our speakers another round of applause.
Test, 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 test.